Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Using Flow Cytometry to Analyze Rare Hematopoietic Cell Subpopulations Implicated in Disease, presented by AllCells. My name is Afshin Shirazi, I'm Marketing Manager at AllCells, and I will be moderating today's presentation. Before we get started, please be aware that there will be a question and answer session immediately following the presentation. You may enter your questions at any time using the GoToWebinar prompt at the right of your screen, and we will address them at the conclusion of the webinar. We're excited to have our bioservices scientist, Anthony Lorenz, present today's webinar. Anthony is a scientist here at All Cells Bioservices Group and has a master's in biomolecular engineering from Tulane University. He worked previously at Tulane Medical and Health Sciences Center and the Australian Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology in stem cell research and immunology. Please welcome Anthony. Um, so, hello to all, and thank you for joining into today's webinar. Here at All Cells, we have over 18 years of experience in the field of hematology and immunology, primary cells, isolation, and manipulation. So, I hope this webinar will allow us to impart some of this in-depth knowledge to you. The flow cytometry assays that are going to be discussed in this presentation, we actually offer in-house. And because of our history in immunology and hematology, we work with numerous clients in pharmaceutical and biotechnology who are actively developing therapies for those with hematopoietic diseases. Today's talk will particularly focus on analyzing cell subsets that are rare in small percentages in the blood or bone marrow or have special functionality. So to briefly review the body's hematopoietic system, this consists of what we know as the normal peripheral blood and also the bodily system of organs and tissues, primarily the bone marrow, spleen, and lymph nodes that are all involved in the production of blood. So when the oxygen content of the body's tissues is actually low or the number of red blood cells decreases, the kidneys will produce and release hormones that stimulate the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. In a similar fashion, the bone marrow also produces and releases more white blood cells into the blood in response to various infections. So cells of the hematopoietic system are all derived from hematopoietic stem cells and mature in the bone marrow. The majority of the terminally differentiated blood cells that you're seeing here on the screen exist in varying percentages in the peripheral blood but many of the myeloid and lymphoid progenitors are actually found exclusively in the bone marrow. Deviations from the hematopoietic lineage hierarchy can be indicative of many disease states. And as scientific researchers know, there are many different diseases that can affect any number or combinations of these cells. This includes cancers and leukemias, which can affect the development of blood cells from the bone marrow, phagocytic disorders, which occur when the cells capable of ingesting pathogens don't function correctly, anemias, which occur when there's not enough red blood cells or hemoglobin, and immuno immunodeficiency diseases, which result in a person not being able to fight off various infections. In addition to aberrant hematopoietic development, the innate and adaptive immune system functionality can be implicated in blood diseases. In a healthy individual's body, a pathogen will first be attacked by professional phagocytic cells, which will attempt to digest foreign material. A stronger immune response will elicit when these digested pathogens are presented to T cells by the phagocytic cells through the MHC2 complex. These T cells, dubbed helper T cells, will subsequently activate B cells to differentiate and produce antibodies. Antibodies are generated to specific pathogens and help the body to tag and clear infection. The immune system also has memory in which B and T cells are programmed to remember certain pathogens from the first experience so that an even quicker and more efficient response can happen the next time. Of course, many other cells are involved in the immune cascade and many of these cells can have dual function. For example, B cells and even granulocytes like neutrophils also can present antigens to T cells. These interactions with T cells define the transition from the innate to adaptive or humoral immunity and actually occurs in your lymph nodes. 
Flow cytometry is an important tool in hematology and immunology in particular and helps researchers understand the behavior of all these different blood cell populations. It allows for the detection of membrane-bound and intracellular proteins, which are indicative of cell phenotype or functionality. And flow cytometry can, flow, can serve as a platform for enriching cell subpopulations, particularly those that are rare or found in low percentages in the blood. The advantages of flow cytometry to other techniques are its capacity for high-throughput screening and the ability for performing multicolor experiments in which many different cell markers can be simultaneously analyzed. Previously, we gave a webinar outlining the fundamentals of flow cytometry called Flow Cytometry 101, and I would invite those new to the field or newer to the field to have it a look. And the web page is listed on this slide. It gives a more basic sort of background about how flow cytometry works and how to actually really basically read a lot of the data. However, in summary, though, I'll just say the three main data readouts from flow cytometry are fluorescence histograms, scatter plots, and bivariate dot plots, which give information about protein expression, cell morphology, as well as co-expression patterns, respectively. So normal peripheral blood from a healthy individual will look like this on a basic flow cytometry scatter plot once most of the red blood cells have been removed, either through lysis or FICOL. The white blood cell components of peripheral blood are clearly noticeable, including the lymphocytes, which include the T and B cells, the granulocytes, which include cells like neutrophils and basophils, and the monocytes, which are important precursors of professional phagocytic cells. Important things to note here are the scatter properties of these distinct populations. Lymphocytes are smaller than monocytes and granulocytes, and the granulocytes have more complex membrane structures than lymphocytes or monocytes. In various disease states, these characteristics will be dramatically altered. Nucleated red blood cells, which are CD71 positive and CD45 negative blood cells, are actually only present in fetal tissues, such as umbilical cord blood, but are often diagnostic of hematological disease states in adults if found in adult peripheral blood. In order to test new diagnostics for this type of malignancy, an enriched population of nucleated red blood cells are, is needed by various pharmaceutical companies involved in this type of research. The different colors shown here are, the, are overlays in the nucleated red blood cell bivariate dot plot showing the pre and post enrichment via flow cytometry. Acute myeloid Leukemia is a cancer of the myeloid line of blood cells and is characterized by the rapid growth of abnormal white blood cells that accumulate in the bone marrow and interfere with the regular production of normal blood cells. Acute myeloid leukemia is the most common acute leukemia affecting adults and its incidence increases with age. Although acute myeloid leukemia is a relatively rare disease, which only accounts for about 2% of cancer deaths in the U.S. per year, its incident is expected to increase as the population ages. Flow cytometry analysis of the white blood cell or mononuclear fraction of blood from, from excuse me, of bone marrow from these patients is markedly different than that of normal healthy individuals. Again, here, if you look at the scatter plot, the healthy sample look similar to the uh, lice sample I showed on the previous slide where you can see the distinct populations like the lymphocytes and monocytes versus the disease sample you see a very, very altered morphology. In addition, these cells often have complex phenotypes with aberrant protein expression, particularly compared to the healthy control. As mentioned previously, in addition to the developmental malignancies of blood cells, many hematopoietic diseases involve a faulty immune system. For example, many autoimmune and inflammatory diseases like lupus or even irritable bowel syndrome involve T cells that attack and destroy the body's own tissue. 
The mechanisms behind these pathologies are rather complex, and many pharmaceutical companies are in the process of identifying novel antibodies that can bind to various T cell subpopulations and tag them for drug interaction, as demonstrated here in these multicolor dot plots of co-expression patterns between a preclinically being tested antibody and T cells. Additionally, rare T cell subsets can be screened for their functionality in healthy donors to use as control subjects in similar drug testing studies. One such assay involved screening donors enriched CD4, CD25, CD127 DIM regulatory T cells for their response to mitogen stimulation with PHA. Another assay involved deriving TH2 polarized T helper cells from multiple donors. This specialized phenotype of T cells isn't solely defined by surface markers alone and requires additional tagging of intracellular cytokines to confirm the phenotype. Although many autoimmune diseases are a result of overactive T cells, many times the issue is not something inherently wrong with the T cells, but instead inflammation occurs from prolonged antigen display by the professional phagocytes like the dendritic cells or macrophages, and thus constant T cell stimulation occurs. Here, we show a drug screening flow cytometry assay in which a compound was being tested in different dosages to see if there was inhibition on the maturation of dendritic cells from CD14 positive monocytes. A number of different markers specific to dendritic cells were analyzed during this experiment, such as CD86, CD83, and CD80, among many others. And we're able to format the overlays of all the conditions to really accurately compare drug effect efficacy and really have a nice uh, spread of data. Since all cells routinely produces dendritic cells in-house, we were actually able to use our in-house catalog product as positive controls as in this assay. And we're able to do that with many other cell-based assays for other cell types that we regularly offer here as catalog products. A cate another category of diseases is immunodeficiency, which describes the class of conditions in which a person's body does not produce enough functional white blood cells in order to fight off infection and disease. This can be a result of viral infection, like with HIV, or due to genetic defects. Neutrophils are granulocytes involved in the innate response to pathogens and can phagocytose foreign material by migrating from the blood into the tissue where the pathogen is via chemotaxis to IL-8, interleukin-8. In immune-compromised patients, there may not exist proper function of these cells. Here we describe an enumeration assay done with neutrophils cultured in transwell plates and we counted the number of neutrophils per donor that were, that were able to migrate towards an IL-8 containing media. Flow cytometry is used here in a different context than previously shown. Instead of expression of a protein or morphological characteristic, flow cytometry is actually used in a more traditional way to count neutrophils using a special custom microbead setup for standardization. Another assay with granulocytes involved stimulating basophils from donor whole blood and screening their response to IgE. The activated phenotype is determined with markers CD123, CD63, and HLA-DR. Our client then went on to select specific donors with certain responses for immunodeficiency drug studies. In conclusion, flow cytometry is a powerful tool that can be used to study a variety of hematopoietic disease states and particularly can help researchers evaluate specific and specialized populations. Hopefully you found some of this information helpful to you and your research needs. Thank you for your attention, and with that, I'll hand the talk back over to Ashin. Thank you very much, Anthony, for the informative presentation. We constantly receive inquiries from customers about flow cytometry and what types of bioservices 
we provide with this platform. So it's great to have this as a resource. Before we jump into the Q&A session, I wanted to point out a few things. Um, immediately following the presentation, within a day you will receive a follow-up email uh, sent to all attendees, which will have additional information regarding how to obtain a free sample bottle of our vital cells cryomedia, specially formulated uh, cryopreservation media. Uh, in addition, we encourage you to discuss any project needs you may have related to bioservices or otherwise using the uh, web link um, www.allcells.com backslash technical support. Uh, also, I encourage you to use the email address bioservices at allcells.com for any follow-up questions. Um, let's go to our first question now from our audience here today. What are the important considerations when analyzing membrane-bound versus intracellular proteins? Sure, uh, that's a great question uh, because obviously depending on what you're wanting to analyze in flow cytometry, the way you prepare the cells is going to be different. So for extracellular membrane-bound proteins, um, the staining protocol is rather straightforward. There's no special buffers. However, if you're going to analyze intracellular proteins, those in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus, um, you're actually going to need a specific type of fixation and permeabilization uh, buffers. For cytoplasmic um, or phosphorylated proteins, in the cytoplasm, you can use alcohol-based um, fixation methods, but for nuclear proteins and transcription factors, you're going to want a detergent-based um, method. Great. Thank you, Anthony. Our next question uh, comes in regarding our disease cells that we talked about today. So the question reads, do you work with other disease types as well? Uh, and if so, uh, how can we correspond with you regarding disease types you may have access to? Uh, yes, so absolutely. Um, in addition to any of the disease tissues that you've seen discussed here today, I, I mean, I want to do point out that all of the disease tissue that you've seen was sourced um, by all cells. And if there's something that is not um, listed in our catalog or on our online website in terms of a disease product that interests you, I really encourage you to reach out to our team um, at the email address listed on the slide here um, because we regularly accommodate custom disease orders and have a very strong network of uh, clinical partners to do so. Um, again, we've been here for 18 years in the Bay Area, so we really have a, a strong foundation and um, a good relationship with all of our clinics. So I encourage you to reach out to us if you didn't see something you're interested in doing research with. Uh, we most likely can help you out. Great. Thank you, Anthony. If there are no more questions, that concludes our webinar for the day. On behalf of Anthony, myself, and the team here at All Cells, I'd like to thank you for your time and joining us and your interest today. We look forward to hosting more educational presentations in the future. Also, if you have not already done so and you'd like to hear about some of these future webinars, please be sure you sign up for our monthly e-newsletter on our homepage, which features information on future webinars such as this, products, uh, news, and events, and promotions as well. Thank you very much. Have a great day.